Hi, Mike. Um, thanks very much for coming along to the museum today uh, and chatting with us about your career in computing. Just wanted to get an idea, uh, basically, where your interest in technology started um, from the very early days. What was your first memory um, of being interested in tech? Um, well, computing specific technology, I can't remember. I used to fiddle and take things apart and a little desk built into a cupboard at home and I would dismantle things and I'd, then try and put them together again. I think it was more dismantling than reassembling. Than back together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So where it all has to start. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and I remember uh, my father, who was chief chemist at Tate & Lyle, the sugar refiners, um, bringing home computer programming things because he was using computers to calculate volumes of sugar in storage warehouses and statistical analysis of um, chemical chemical purity and stuff uh, and that that's where that was my first sort of exposure to, to computing and so, then so when was that uh well that must have been late 60s early 70s right. uh, and then at school I was lucky that we had a dial-up um, terminal to a Sigma 9 computer time-sharing service uh, provided to the school by a company. I can't remember who it was, so I'll have to think back. Um, and there you could do programming. Right. And that was um, APL, which right. is a strange, bizarre language well, well a ahead of its time. A programming language. Like, well ahead of its time, well ahead of its time sadly gone and so that was my first exposure to computing right. and then I knew from that point on that that's what I wanted to do when I'd done my A-levels I wanted to do computer science uh -huh. um, and in those days uh, I applied to and got into Cambridge and uh, Cambridge has a long long history of computing but uh, in 1977 computer science wasn't really considered that there was enough material there for it to be a three-year course right. So I had to do, my first year was um, natural sciences, mass physics, chemistry, crystalline state. And then my part two, I could do two years computer science. Okay. A year later, they decided they actually had enough material now to teach a full three-year computer science course. So, but a bit too early. Yeah, 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 I was forced to do a few things I didn't want to do <laughs> before I could get to the good stuff. Right. So you was at Cambridge University then? Yeah. And you were studying there um, at the computer lab? Uh, yeah, at the, at the computer lab. It used to be in the centre of town. And um, yeah, uh, times were different. In, I graduated, what, 1980. Things were a bit different then. I hadn't, I sort of had it in my mind that I presumed I would end up going to London and looking for a job, but I hadn't. And I'd graduated and I bumped into a mate of mine, a guy called uh, Joe Dunn, who uh, went on to move to the States and work for Macromedia and Flash mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. Um, and he said, oh, I've just got a job at a company called Acorn, and this was the Barclays Bank Money Machine. It, it was then in um, market, the, the market. Market Hill. And he said, oh, it's over there, and pointed to the opposite side of... Um, Market Hill, and there's a little alleyway down, which is now by the Gap. It used to be the electricity showroom, and down that alleyway there was a um, where Acorn ended up. It was called um, CPU Group in yeah. those days, mm -hmm. uh, Cambridge Processor Unit. Um, and he said, "Well, they're, they're looking for other people. Why don't you go and um, go and see if they're interested?" So that's where I wandered over to, and. Um, Ended up being interviewed. Uh, part of the interview takes place, of course, in the women's toilets because uh, <laughs> that's where the uh, poker machines were. And uh, CPU group in those days were doing little uh, single board embedded controllers. Right. And um, they were being used in poker machines. That was one of the, one of the applications. Right. And, and also the, fruit machines as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one of you know, the interview questions were around, you know, the odds in poker, uh, could I do maths? And um, how would you protect the uh, microcontroller from what was a new craze then, piezoelectric yeah, lighters? Yeah. So people would go click, 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 click. Just after reset. the machines, reset, reset, get random payout. So yeah, that was it. And right. actually, I ended up working for a company that was called Orbis, which was owned by Herman and Andy, Andy Hopper, Hopper, who uh, right. was one of my lecturers in the computer lab. So right. I kind of stayed in the family. And Orbis quite quickly got absorbed into 
what became Acorn as all the bits were put together and it formed so Acorn. So what was the order there? So was it Orbis, you was at Orbis first and then Acorn or Acorn uh, then? The, no, Orbis I was at Orbis first, right. um, although my paychecks always came from CPU Group. Oh, okay. Uh, although, right. yeah, no, <laughs> don't know, don't know, I don't know what happened to the <laughs> national insurance contribution, how, 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 that, how that worked. Um, but then um, CPU Group went away, Acorn was the brand, I think it then became Acorn. And uh, the products we'd been doing at Orbis, which was the um, commercialising the research that had gone on in Cambridge University with the Cambridge Ring, which was yeah. sort of um, an alternative to Ethernet. Yeah. You know, Ethernet at that point was starting to become the dominant networking technology. So the, the Orbis stuff went away and that just rolled into, into Acorn. Mm -hmm. And then that became Acorn from then on. So then that, that would have become the, the, the Cambridge Ring technology would have been ended up being sort of Econet or Econet? Uh, none of the actual technology no. ended up in Econet. It was different. Right. Um, so no, I wouldn't say it really had anything no, to do okay. with Econet. I, I guess the interest in networking and the importance of having a network in every computer, because the Orbis stuff had been all about how you build single peripheral computers. The only peripheral they had was the network, and you attached and all the peripherals on the network, network and you had yep. racks of computers and all that stuff. So the idea that networking was a fundamental part of computing, which wasn't that prevalent mm. home computers tended to be standalone things yeah. and i guess acon with its push for schools and building networks out of them so the idea that networking was important came from it but the underlying technology completely different didn't right. it? okay okay I'll lie into that. so i mean i've heard that actually um you were kind of um found in a pub um and after uh, university and somebody might have said to you what you up to and you hadn't quite no no it was you it, hadn't quite sort of worked it all out yet and no i certainly hadn't worked you. it out but no it was me meeting joe at the money machine <laughs> right, um, okay. i don't recall any trip to, no the the the, the pub story sure? is all the founding of um interview first meeting with robin saxby creation of right. uh, uh, of arm that, right. that, that that i do remember as okay. a pub meeting but right. no the first one no i was found on a street corner like <laughs> a street corner <laughs> taking cash out of a machine that is, is the true story <laughs> okay so working at acorn um what was that like at that time um what was going on when you joined so it would have been the early days of the, the BBC Micro, was the BBC Micro out at that time? Uh, no, no, that, that, so the that BBC was... Micro was just coming together at that point. Right. So, so um, I, I can't remember, to be honest, when Orbis transitioned into Acorn. It must have been 81, 82. Um, and then, um, so I never really worked on, on uh, uh, I didn't work on the BBC or the Electron right. or any of those variants because we started... Um, the work on Project A, which turned into into ARM uh, in '83. Right. Okay. So the BBC Micro was out by then. Um, so, so what were you doing at, at Acorn? Because it, it, it says online that you were working on portable devices for Acorn. Um, the only portable device I can remember kind of were the rebadged um, Scion. Well, that 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 came at the end. Right. So at the beginning, it was um, Project A. Right. And I was responsible for, I mean, Project A was a envisaged as a four chip solution. Um, the main processor, graphics, memory controller, and the IO controller. And I was responsible for the design of the IO the controller. IO, yeah. um, and that led through into a second generation of that. And then a few years into that, I guess the late 80s, um, we were doing less and less chip developments because the money wasn't there to do it, the sales mm. weren't really there, and we'd been gone bust and bought by all of, well, gone bust twice, been bought by Olivetti, um, and um, I'd actually stopped working on any of the um, um, technology at that point right. and was working with Olivetti to put together laptops for arm for arm based laptops oh, okay which never came to anything I was gonna say, didn't yeah you no know, that, that that and there were various prototypes built so it was reusing their chassis their keyboards all of the mechanics and stuff came from olivetti laptops but it was then how did we put on uh, motherboards into olivetti laptops right. but that never that never made it out into a product i 
Yeah, I don't. I mean, it was think... the Acorn A4, wasn't there? That was the the, the laptop that yeah but that, existed. But that this was came, something different that, for that for came before that. Right. And um, yeah, I guess that's when we had the approach from Apple about mm. create use it them using ARM technology, and that then led into the spin out, and I went back into. Um, effectively the chip the development chipset. team as then right. because um, as the second generation IOC um, had um, I'd done some work on the memory subsystems and then one of the things Apple wanted to do when they um, took ARM was we had this 26-bit address space um, on a 32-bit process with all the flags tucked away neatly at the top of the address space. They wanted a full 32-bit address space. Right. And I designed, but we'd never built, MEMC2, which was the proper VM memory management system to replace MEMC1, right. which was the original mapping system that didn't really work that well for, for, for Linux. So I'd done the design of that new memory management system which is what we needed to effectively combine with the existing ARM, take the 26-bit ARM, turn it into full 32-bit, put it together with the new memory controller. That's what the ARM 600 project was, which was technically what they wanted. Right. So I came back to be involved because I had the, 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 the track record in doing in the memory subsystems. Mm -hmm. But by that point, I'd stopped doing mainstream engineering and I uh, was doing more marketing, yeah. which is why after the meeting in the pub with Robin or whatever, I ended up running marketing for ARM. Right. Although technically I was contributing with Apple onto the, the memory management architecture. And there was a whole bunch of in innovation went into that memory architecture before we finally built. Right. I'll, I'll come on to the marketing bit. Yeah, because sure. I don't understand how a marketing person and engineer can be in the same body. I mean... <laughs> It's easy. Well, I'm not How so sure. hard could it be? You must go home hating yourself <laughs> every night or, or selling products to people that you haven't designed yet. Um, but, um, I, anyway. yeah, yeah, okay, we'll come to that. <laughs> we'll come to that. So, I mean, I've got a, a couple of things here. So, you're talking about the, the chipset. Um, so, we have there the, that's the R1 processor. Yeah, that's um, an ARM engineering sample. Engineering sample, absolutely. Um, VC2588, yes, yeah, so the VLSI technology, unbelievable numbers. Yep. <laughs> And there's your IOC data sheet there for, for that chipset. So oh, this is mine because that, that, that's, that's my writing. It's, it's got and that's, MMM that's, on top that's, of And that's on the die. It did, it did cause problems with the um, DRC checks, but that was my little thing I wanted on it. On, and that on, was on, on the, the die as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> it's a little Illuminati iron, 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 iron a pyramid. If you, look, if you look at the layout, you'll, you'll find it's there. Don't start any more Illuminati stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, at least it'll get us a lot of views on YouTube. Um, Mark Muller, part of the Illuminati. Um, so, um, you heard it here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so the, the chipset originally was, was four chips, wasn't it? So you had yep. the ARM processor, um, like you say, IOC, MEMC, and VIDC. Um, you were working on um, the IOC part of it, um, but they like you just just to make sure we've got this this right. You were then working on the the ARM um, 600 or 610, um, and that kind of brought all that together into the one chip. Is that right? Uh, no, a bit more than that. A bit less than that. A bit less than that. Okay. Uh, ARM 600 brought together, a f in some ways, an ARM three, so processor and cache. Mm -hmm took its 26-bit address and turned it into 32 bits and combined it with MEMC2, oh, which was the okay. full virtual memory system, mm -hmm. with some changes. That became ARM 600. Right. Okay. There wasn't any video or I.O. integrated. So at that point, the ARM 600 we thought was going to be used with VIDC2, which was the second generation VIDC, mm -hmm. and some I.O. system. Um, right. There was a chip called, which, what did I call it, Louis, Life, the Universe and Everything. Nice. Which came a few years later where we effectively did a cost engineering of taking an ARM2, a VIDC, 1A, an IOC and a MEMC and um, putting it all onto one die. Right. So that was a kind of a cost reduction exercise of the original chipset. Mm -hmm. But the ARM600, because Apple wanted to take the ARM600 and put it with their own subsystem. So all their I.O. And, and physical memory control and stuff was all done in, the, they, they were doing their own ASIC in, for it. Right, and yeah. they then were putting that next to an ARM 600. Right, okay. And then 
the ARM 610 was a cost-engineered ARM 600 because it removed the ability to have um, external coprocessors, so it needed fewer pins, yep. few bug fixes, and that, that became the 610, which was effectively a cut-down ARM 600. And fortunately, a very useful device to have in your mobile thing, which would and, be the thing that, that, that Apple wanted. Yeah, personal digital assistant, that was the, that was the, that was the mobile device. Right. So just go back slightly then um, before we come on to, to Apple. Um, so tell me a little bit more about the meeting in the pub and the beginning of, I mean, was it 12 people that started on? So you take it back, Acorn's running out of money repeatedly. It's designing its own chips, its own software, its own apps, its own distribution channel, its own everything. It's not, susta it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And there have been various attempts to, could we sell off the chip bit and there was a couple of business plans got written for this chip business and the then CTO of Acorn was a guy called Malcolm Bird, st still lives around here, mm -hmm. and to his credit he actually really came up with the licensing business model. Right. So everyone else designed and manufactured chips, we were designing it and licensing it for other people to manufacture and Acorn had effectively licensed VLSI technology to make the chip. Initially, for us, it was mm -hmm. just contract manufacturing. Yep. But they then said they had other customers who were interested in those chips. Could they sell the chip? VLSI. VLSI. Right, okay. And we said yes, and there was a deal done that effectively was they did some of the production engineering on test pattern work and, 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 and getting it to volume manufacture in exchange for the right to sell the chips for a royalty back to Acorn. And that, so they were our first licensee, yeah. the first sale of ARM technology outside of Acorn's own use. That's how Apple actually got to see the uh, ARM chip because VLSI was a supplier to, to Apple and they'd gone in, why don't you use this, got this great chip, why don't, why, why, why don't you use this? Were, were Apple um, using something different for their, their Newton in the first place? Well, yeah, I mean, this even um, predates the Newton. There was almost an Apple... Um, normal Apple with a keyboard that right. they thought about building with an ARM chip, but uh -huh. never did. Yeah. Um, and then, so, so, backing up a bit. So, Malcolm had the idea of the licensing business model. We had that business plan, but couldn't find anyone who wanted to really be a customer or invest in it or whatever. So, that, that, that never, never went anywhere. Then, Apple built this prototype of a product that didn't go anywhere. Then they were building the Newton. They were using um, a chip that had actually been designed by AT&T. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's the one. Uh, um, called the Hobbit. Various reasons that hadn't gone well for them. Uh, and they were looking around for an alternative. Mm -hmm. And they were, had been exposed to arms. So they came to Acorn and there was a meeting where they kind of went, we're interested in look at using uh, the ARM chip couple of issues. One, there's some kind of technical changes we'd like because we want to have a full virtual memory, 32-bit virtual memory system. Mm -hmm. And how's it going to work? Because we're sort of competitors yeah. with you because they're both selling into schools and what, you know, how, how's that going to work? At which point Malcolm kind of goes, well, fortunately, here's a business plan I have. Why don't we create a spin-out uh, and then you can have... Um, control and influence on the board, the competition issue goes away, we, the, the spin-out can do the technology changes that you want, mm. why, don't we, why don't we do that? Um, and that's how, that's how the JV got, got, okay. got created. I kind of heard that it was more Apple insisting that if we we're going to do business, this was how it must be. No, no. Okay. no uh, he was already thinking along those lines. Oh yeah, lines. we were thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right time. Right, right, right time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they had to do a bit of work internally. You know, mm. why the hell are you creating a JV? Why can't we just buy technology? So, uh, no, no, it, was, it wasn't sort of big, 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 big hungry. Apple. It comes along and tells you what to do. Right. Um, they weren't quite as big in those no, days. No, no, um, But then we're neither were Acorn, so it's <laughs> relatively yeah, speaking. Yeah, so, um, right, so okay. and, and, that, and the JV got formed out of that. And then there were 12 of us, which are f was close to kind of like the 11 people who were still left doing chip stuff and me who'd come back because of this memory management stuff that needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. So there were then 12 of us. We got spun out. We became Advanced Risk Machines Limited. Mm -hmm. um, and we were, we were still in a sort of sectioned off bit of um, 
the silver building on the, behind the waterworks uh, in, in Cherry Hinton mm -hmm. as arm, but not part of Acorn anymore, yeah. but just the 12 engineers. And then the non-execs, which were effectively the Acorn management and the Apple management, who were sort of the board of that company, mm -hmm. went off to recruit a CEO. And Robin Saxby was the first CEO. Mm -hmm. And we had this fabled meeting in a pub, um, which we told him was halfway between Maidenhead and Cambridge, but of course it was... <laughs> Closer to <laughs> a little bit closer to Cambridge than that, um, uh, where 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 he met us and we were sort of interviewing him and he was kind of interviewing us, right. and it was there that he kind of went. Does anyone want to be a little more commercial? And a few of us kind of went. No. So that was me, Tudor, Jamie, um, and because he he said, well, you know, we, we 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 the start the JV had a million pounds in cash. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's the money we had. And it was kind of, you know, how are we going to spend that money? Either some of you step up and take on commercial roles, which you don't know what you're doing, but you understand the technology. You'll or, get the hang of it. Or we have to go and recruit uh, commercial people who don't understand the technology, yeah, but know yeah. what they're doing and will cost more money. Mm -hmm. And he took a gamble at that point, And I ended up, because I've been doing marketing in arm at the end, um, that I ran marketing. Um, marketing with an acorn at the end. Yes. So, right. Well, and it's product marketing, yeah, right? This yeah. wasn't Marcoms, this was product marketing, which is technical, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so Jamie ended up running sales and Tudor ran engineering, and S Robin was CEO and chief Marcom person. He was the guy talking to the press and doing the kind of rah rah glitzy marketing, mm -hmm. and I was doing product marketing mm -hmm. in. What is the spec of this project we're doing with Apple? If we're going to sell this to somebody else, where's the documentation? What's the next product going to look like? That was the technical marketing stuff. That's what I did. I mean, joking aside with the, the whole engineer and, and, and marketing person in the same body, he, that's absolutely necessary isn't it? In, in terms of what Arm was doing. It's an incredibly technical area. Your, yeah, your well, marketing people have got to know that. It was a technical set, but so. and, 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 and Jamie used to do VLSI design, mm. right? And he ran sales mm. because the whole thing was a technical sell. So you got to know your market. Yeah, yeah, we were all technical sales. Yeah, yeah. Point. so that was quite different probably for yeah, the way a lot of companies were, were set up at that time. Yeah. So the, the initial meetup, um, we've now got a gang of 12. Is that what it's referred to, um, speaking? speaking? Well, no, well, you, you almost, but actually it was Gang of Four, uh, uh, which then became Gang of Five, and then became Gang of X, which you might pick up the references or not, uh, uh, um, which was the management team. Right. So Robin, Jamie, me, Tudor, Gang of Four. Right. Sort of, because I mean, it's small, there's no, the org structure is, 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 is arbitrary, but mm -hmm. that's effectively what the management team was. So that, right. was the gang of, that was the Gang of Four. Right, okay. And then grew to the Gang of Five, and then it became GX, and then as we got bigger and bigger, there was more structure and organisation, and uh, where you go. But yeah, that, gr that, that original merry band of boys and girls. What was it like? Um, that had to be exciting, surely. Yeah, we have to remember all these things. It's all perfectly normal because your it's life always work. is yep. perfectly normal. Yep. Uh, um, and we were just getting on trying to take on the world. And I still sometimes forget that we're not the little guy and the underdog and we had no money, we had nothing. Um, you go find creative solutions for going out and selling stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was it was... You don't, really th you don't think about it at the time, I know, right? I know you don't. It, it, what was it like? It I know. was like kind of I went to work. But you how, got do you, on how do you remember it? I mean, you, um, I mean, it, you can see on your face you pretty much remember it very fondly. Um, I mean, I've got some photographs um, that show that you had a fairly good time. Uh, you know, you, yeah, you had your barbecues. I, 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 I mean, early um, on, Robin, Robin's one of his sayings was, you know, work hard, play hard, it, uh, and that, that's what it was. We right. had a good time, but. Mm -hmm. it, we were working hard. Absolutely. It's a classic yeah. startup kind of thing. You just get down and do it. And yeah. you know, the money was running out, so there were no pay rises. And are we going to get paid? And you know, it's all that kind of that that all the kind of normal startup stuff, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And 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 you're clearly doomed, and none of it's going to work. And then you manage to crawl your way out, and 
<laughs> keep I mean, calling. But, it, but it is a fantastic story, isn't it? I mean, I, yeah, I keep romanticising all these kind of things, but you've got a product there that was built for, to go in the Archimedes. Um, it was just the next generation of the BBC Micro. It wasn't necessarily low power for the reasons that people think it was low power. It was to save a bit of money it on heat sinking and everything. It was simple <laughs> yeah. um, because you didn't have the technology to do anything more complicated, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and then that product, it, you know, and I keep hearing, as many people as I talk to, the one common story that keeps coming up is it being about the right time in the right place. And life is 50% chance. It's what you do with that, that yeah. luck, that chance. And you can also make luck to a certain extent. The more you do, the more chance that things are going to... And we've numbers go. stretched it out. I mean, in that people kind of think different people see arm having happened from different points. Mm. Um, if, you, if you go back to the beginning, 1990, Newton failed product, never shipped in any volume, um, you know, we had to retrench as an embedded microcontroller. We went from Archimedes, Newton, the main processor running big operating systems and apps mm -hmm. down to this is embedded real-time control. It's mm -hmm. a 32-bit microcontroller. Caches, memory management units, they all went out the window. ARM 7 TDMI, the product that made ARM with the design went into Nokia, was an embedded microcontroller. There were no mm -hmm. caches, there was no MMU, it was a little microcontroller. Um, so, you know, like everything, there's the pivot, there's the change, which kind of happens, it doesn't happen suddenly, it happened to us quite slowly. Yeah, and it's but, reacting to situations. But if you look at that, you know, that's 1990, 95 when that product gets launched, 97, 98 before it turns into a Nokia mobile phone, 2000 by the time any volume is really shipping. We kept our luck going for 10 years as it were. We had a, lucky, a couple of lucky breaks in there in, in, in 93 and 95. So what would that mean? So uh, the first lucky break is, is Apple with the Newton, as much as it wasn't a particularly... Yeah, that's, um, what, that's, that's what created, that's that, what created what the company. What started it all off. What was the next lucky break? Um, TI licensing ARM 7 for automotive. Right, okay. Took them... I'm going to get this wrong. 15 years before they ever shipped a product in automotive. <laughs> probably 12 years before right. they ever shipped. But, but that's why they, they, the, 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 it was the automotive group who wanted a 32-bit microcontroller for automotive. Um, and TI was, I can't remember, was the world's third, fourth largest semiconductor company in those days. Mm -hmm. It was at the top. Why were they licensing from ARM? We had two other licensees. We had... Well, so we had three. VLSI technology, because we got them from the beginning. Yep, yep. GEC Plessy semiconductors, who don't exist anymore because Robin used to work for them and his mates, and it was in the UK, and if we couldn't flog it to them, who the hell could we flog it to? Um, Sharp, because Sharp were, were manufacturing the Newton for Apple. Yep. And they didn't like the fact that they had to buy the chips from VLSI Technology or GEC Plessy. Okay. They had a chip company. Why couldn't they make it make themselves? It. So they became a licensee on the back of the volumes they thought they were going to get out of Newton. Mm -hmm. And then along comes TI. So right, we so kind of picked up four. some guys for lots of reasons and none of them were kind of like number one. And no. then there, there's TI Technology picking the technology and going, we don't have the right 32-bit microcontroller, even though they had... They had their own processors and DSPs and mm. all sorts of things. Uh, for yeah, TI had a whole range of. They had everything, mm. right? They were the world, one of the world's biggest semiconductors. They, they had everything, and they, they 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 identified that this this would fit their need for automotive. Once they had it, they were going to promote it and sell it to anyone, and they were trying to sell DSP into uh, Nokia. Right. And Nokia was in the process of evaluating DSPs and microcontrollers, and they were going with um, it was Hitachi for the microcontroller, and therefore maybe TI were going to lose the DSP socket as well. Right. And they proposed DSP and ARM7. 
Nokia went a long way down the road and went, you know, this is really good. And towards the end of that design, they were saying, yeah, but we've looked at the code density. And I know, Arm, you have the best code density of any 32-bit uh, risk processor because we were a little bit sisky. We had these load multiples and all these funny instructions that weren't pure risk, but right. they gave us really good code density. We were very proud of our code density. And they said, well, but we've taken our software stack and we've compiled it. And if we do it for our 16-bit Hitachi, um, we can fit it into a smaller, smaller ROM, and they they come in. You have to buy twice as much once you cross the boundary. It's going to cost us more to move to ARM because we're going to have to double the size of the memory because your code density isn't as good as this 16-bit microcontroller. Right. So for this design, we're going to have to stick with our existing microcontroller. And it was out of that a trip back from Finland that Dave Jagger kind of came up with the idea of well we can have a 16, an instruction set encoded into 16 bits, but it operates on a full 32-bit processor. The, the, the size of the processor wasn't the problem, it was the size of the code. So yeah. doing effectively code compression into a subset of ARM to create a smaller instruction set that could be encoded in 16 bits <laughs> that you could then decode into the full 32-bit. So that was the 16-bit mode, the yep. thumb mode, because it's on the side of the arm. <laughs> One of those marketing things that we never came up with a better name, and so thumb stuck. So that was ARM 7 TDMI, uh -huh. T for thumb, D for Didn't debug, M for the high-speed multiplier, I for ICE invent the, the, the debug port. Yep. Um, uh, 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 ARM 7 TDMI became the thing and Nokia went, that's good enough, that's you fixed the code density, that was the design win. If Nokia, who then were the world's number one for mobile phones, yeah. if Nokia's using ARM for, for, for mobile, it must be the right thing. And we started to get licenses from other people who wanted to do mobile. And in those days, mobile was starting to explode. And so if you were anybody who wanted to do mobile, you want to do mobile, you need mobile chips, you're going to design your own chip, you need to use an ARM, because Nokia's using it, the software's being written for it, that's the right choice. And that's the, that's the second lucky break that, that made ARM, and that drove us into the phone and then the start of the feature phone business. Mm -hmm which takes you through Symbian, all of those stories yep. that you have elsewhere. I guess to the next lucky break, which is the transformation of smartphone yep. revolution. I mean, and Nokia had smartphones, but they got so many things wrong in so many ways. And mm -hmm. Apple came along with, with, with the iPhone and they, for all the right reasons, picked ARM. Mm -hmm. And that's the next kind of lucky Listen. break, right? Um, <laughs> and as I say, you make your own luck, you have to be in the right place at yeah, the right time. Absolutely. Early days of ARM, you know, that was a lucky break that we played out over 10 years. And that also was, that was Moore's Laws happening. Because at the beginning of ARM, people designed their own microprocessors and manufactured them. And if you wanted to build a product, you put together half a dozen chips on a board a memory controller, an I.O. controller, or a, or a hard disk, disk drive controller, or a serial port, or I'll buy a two-port serial chip. So you had chips that just had two RS-232 serial ports. You assembled all of these components and built your product. And then as Moore's Law said, you could put those all onto one chip. Yep. At some point, the microprocessor was going to be in the chip. And if you didn't have a microprocessor, you were never going to win the business. How good your peripherals were, all mm. your peripherals were going to move to the place that had the microprocessor. Yep. And so there was an awful lot of people who didn't have a microprocessor but had all the other bits, and therefore they'd survive by second sourcing other people's stuff, but now we gave them the ability to be a first-class microprocessor provider, microcontroller provider, if they licensed our technology. So that mm. was right time in terms of the industry consolidating enabling a new business model which was license IP yeah. you don't have to design it all mm -hmm. and out of that comes the whole software ecosystem because there are a hundred or hundreds of ARM licensees all with different designs but all pulling on a lot of the same software components so that yeah. software ecosystem becomes the thing that you get economies of scale yeah. if you want it somebody's already written the software for it and that's what drove ARM but you know, it didn't, it, it's not, it, it's, there are some little events where you really were in the right place at the mm. right time and others where you've been loitering on the street corner long enough that the right time 
comes. Yeah, you're going to yeah. wait for that time to come. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And it's also about creating the tools as well. I mean, as far as I understand it, the ARM product had very good tools um, that allow people to do that development. Because we knew from the beginning that, you know, microprocessor was only good as, as good as the compiler, mm -hmm. right? This wasn't just a hardware cell, it was a software cell, which is why we then spent all of our time and effort working with the OS providers, whether it was Symbian or Microsoft or the real-time Artos guys, because when looked at from an end um, product company, you needed to get the chip from the chip guy, you needed to get the software from half a dozen different software guys, and our job was to orchestrate not only you have a choice of hardware guys you can go and get your chips from, but you have a choice of software guys that you can go and get your OS. Mm. Is it running Linux or Unix in those days or whatever, or is it running Symbian or is it running Microsoft, whatever software you want, yeah. we worked on that software component as much as we worked on the actual hardware designs. Yeah. And we've always had that view that, you know, it's, it's about the system. Yeah, so it's about the package and making sure that they've got everything they need to, to make it work. Fantastic. So you, so you talked about the, the early days a little bit there. I've got some, some photographs there. I don't know if you can talk us through them a little bit. Um, so they should take you back to about 91, is it? Uh, yes, so at the beginning of, uh, uh, of, of ARM as a JV, we had a technical advisory board, which didn't have any voting rights or anything, but comprised technical representatives from ARM and ACORN, so make sure we did the right things for the roadmap, and VLSI Technology, who were a minority shareholder and our first licensee. And um, we met once a year to bring these people together, effectively to agree what the roadmap was. And that's what turned into our ARM partner meeting that we now hold every year and have thousands of people coming to Cambridge for. Oh. So this is kind of, this is sort of the first ever one right. of those under a slightly different guise. And that is me with, oh, I've got my hair cut by then, with relatively short hair, you know, hunched over and still wearing the brown cardigan. Yeah. <laughs> and then guys from um, ARM, VLSI. Right. And this would have been at Swaffen Bolbeck? That is in the barn. It's kind at, of barn conversion, isn't it? That's yeah. the barn it just, conversion. It looks fantastic. When you, yeah. when you, you say the word arm and then you show the building, they just don't go together. It's just, it's a, I don't know, it's just really nice. Um, yeah, so that's... The barn conversion is Swaffen Bolbeck. Yeah. the beginnings of it all. Oh dear, this is me, this is me. Well, this is quite funny because on the, on the, on the photograph it says a young MM. Um, and... I would have sworn that young MM was young Malcolm McLaren. <laughs> um, <laughs> because cause it doesn't look like you. Um, uh, but if we ignore that part of it for the minute. That, we, that we, is me. That, <laughs> that is me. I don't know who took this photograph. I'm in front of an A500. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Uh, and so the A, I mean, the development of the chipset with the first ever board was um, uh, BBC Machine, one of its expansion ports was a second processor yep. so it was dual processor from the beginning mm -hmm. um, and uh, the first one was an arm just an arm cpu as a second processor yep. then there was the um, arm 500 2p which was most of the, it was the chipset the complete chipset but still as a second processor so we could bring it up and test things but still rely on the bbc machine um, to bring it up and make host, it a yeah. primary thing. Uh -huh. And then we cut the umbilical cord and the A502 P turned into an A500, which was the first, the stat, the first real standalone computer that was built as a pro. I mean, there was only built as a prototype. Mm, we built, mm. I can't remember, 50 of them or something as the first right, okay. pro prototype run, you know, metal cases. We had some custom plastics made for the, for the front and whatever. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that they're, was, they're pop, well, semi-properly produced machine. Yeah, so, so what yeah. were you using them for? Was it, were you just running tests on them or were you actually actively using them in-house for duties? Um, well, we always used our own kit. So mm -hmm. um, most of the CPU, well, I, IOC, VIDC, MEMC, all of that was designed, a lot of that was designed on BBC Micros. Mm, yeah. uh, the system and the chip level simulations were run in basic. Yep. And you've got examples of the code for that. Uh -huh. We obviously had to do um, transistor placement using third party um, workstations, Apollo yeah. workstations. Yep. So we were using them to do all of our own design on. So these were our working computers to design right. the next generation, do bug fixes or whatever send emails and it became the development platform for writing the software there was the ill-fated os that never happened because the arm um, i mean these machines were, weren't supposed to ship with arthur 
there was a complete next generation um, OS being developed in America All right. that never made the light of day, it never delivered, it was written in modular 2, it was all object orientated, it has all sorts of whizzy and wacky things to go along with the brand new architecture right. and that was always late and always late and always late and then at the last minute Arthur was hacked together in no time at all as the OS that came out as Arch the Archimedes OS. Yep. Um, I didn't know that. that was a a late <laughs> diving catch um, <laughs> because the 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 because the OS was ne never came. Right. You should fly to fly to San Francisco, interview Joe, and Joe can give you the whole story of that because we created there was a research group created in Palo Alto uh, that were developing that whole OS, and Joe went out to the states from the UK to be part of that development team that never went anywhere. So did that OS have a name? Um, it did, and oh, my memory's failing me. Oh, I'll, I'll have to find that one out. I'm um, interested in that. That's interesting. Oh, why can't I remember these things? Oh, I can't I'm remember getting too old. I'm getting too old. That. So yeah, there was a whole story about that. the software, right. that, the software system that never was. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so Archimedes was, uh, yeah, Arthur was a... It little, was pretty limited when it, when it yeah, came Yeah, it was, it was hacked together but, in months right. versus years of development of the hardware and years of development of the OS that never was. Uh -huh. And that's why the software was always a bit We've got it like running on one of the, um, uh, the A400s or whatever, I can't remember. It's, uh, yeah, so who knows what I was doing, uh, doing there. I was probably... Malcolm yeah. McLaren impersonation yeah, by the look of it. But that's, um, still, that's, that's still in Acol. That's in the silver building. I recognise the Herman Miller furniture. Yeah, so that was definitely in the silver building. Right. So that was before we moved to the barn. Right. Late 80s. 80, yeah. Late 80s. Late 80s. Right, okay. Late 80s. Interesting bit of info on the A500 there. So we've got a, a couple of them in the museum um, and uh, they do get a lot of interest because obviously people that are into ACOR stuff have just never seen those machines. They never saw the light of day um, outside um, and, uh, and ACOR. Um, so what have we got next? Uh, what have we got next? Um, oh, that's me and Serena. Serena is a friend of mine. She never, she never worked for ACOR. That's um, what we'd put down as the first arm barbecue. Oh, that's the barbecue. Uh, right. um, recently, the, the catering manager at Arm kind of said, well, I've seen the photo of the first arm barbecue. You know, do you have the menu for that? We'd like to recreate it as an... And I kind of looked and went, it was a barbecue. <laughs> <It> was <laughs> Meat and beer? <laughs> yeah, it was 25 years ago. <laughs> we had burgers. Um, yeah, yeah. That goes back. So, so what, what was the arm barbecue? Well, why, um, why, why did that happen? No, oh, there's another, another picture. There's a young Simon Seegers um, with someone who isn't his wife. Um, my wife made me throw away those, those nice um, shark print shorts. They were um, nice and shark print shorts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I didn't know not, whether I should not, bring them up or not. Yeah, not according to her. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, no, we, it, just, it was like we'd all be working hard. It was time to have a barbecue because in Swaff and Bullback we had the... The, you know, we were on the side of the field, it was easy to be able to, to have that and the farmer provided some bales um, and that became a tradition. Right. And we've done a summer barbecue ever, 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 ever since. And that was the kind of, it was girlfriends in those days, it's now kids and yeah. wives and girlfriends and, and else, yeah. whatever. Right. But that just became part of the social calendar, we'll do that. And we'll do a Christmas dinner at Christmas time and a summer barbecue. Um, Arm likes its traditions, doesn't it? He, yeah, he's got his champagne bottles when you launch new we're silicon. We're simple bunnies most <laughs> of the time. You know, like it works. Oh, it's fantastic. It again. Yeah, it's I think fine. it's fantastic. Yeah. Robin and Trent Poltronetti. You're right. You asked, uh, was that his butler? It, it does look a little bit like that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a fantastic yeah. picture. Yeah. Uh, but it's just uh, yeah. <laughs> your yeah, mail, yeah. sir. Oh yes, this is us in the pub, the Swap and Bullbet pub, because the pub was 200 metres walk away. And uh, in those days, of course, it was a trip there for a pint at lunchtime and uh, something to eat and walk back. And that, that was normal business that day, was wasn't it? Yeah. You know, and, everybody um, was doing it. Steve but this Herber isn't would the, manage this to eat a whole bar though. of chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, this but was... But this isn't the first meeting in the pub. This is... No, 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 no. This, okay. is, this is Swap and Bull. No, this, 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 this I think, was um, Steve's from Sharp. Yeah. Uh, um, guy, he, he, he was our technical contact in Sharp, lived in Portland. Um, uh, he was a great guy because he reminded me of Colombo. Because right. like, I flew to Portland 
come out of the airport and there's this sort of large man in a slightly dirty beige <laughs> Mac comes towards me and that's Steve, Steve Sidman. So that was the, my first meeting with Steve Sidman. Right. Um, and I think I'm pretty certain that's when he came to, came, came to Cambridge and they took a picture of us, uh, took a picture of us all in the pub. <laughs> yeah. Didn't take many pictures back in the day, did we? Because it was all proper photographs on. You had film. to have them developed. It was so expensive. It was different. The cameras were. That's why I thought when when yeah. we do get access to these kind yeah. of things, they are gold yeah. dust to us because yeah. they do capture that time. Um, and there are so few pictures of, you know, just everyday work life. And then this one's much later. This is um, in arm one. Um, this must be a celebration of. Um, it just says holding up phones on the back. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, this must have been 20 years. I think this was, this was our 20 year oh. anniversary celebration in Arm 1. Right. Um, and... Um, it's changed a bit there, hasn't it? Yeah, everyone was, I think, yeah. yeah. Different building, a few more people. A lot more people. <laughs> I still knew some of them in those days. <laughs> Yeah, and now of course we're building a new building because none of this site's big enough anymore. I know, it's incredible. It's such an amazing success story. Um, but um, yeah, so just quickly there, so you've got your, the Apple Newton. The oh, but not the original. This was, this, was, this was second, third generation, 110. No, it's a 110, is it? Okay, take it back. I yeah. mean, I'll, you know, of course, I was going to get the 100 out and I thought, no, I won't. I'll give him Steve Ferber's one. Uh, Steve Ferber's. I'll treat it with, with yeah, respect. Yeah. Does it still work? Yeah, it still works. Powers up. Yep. And um, yeah, there is a clip of me writing my. Uh, I don't think I was married to it at the time, but my 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 wife's name to try and see if it would do handwriting recognition. Well, interestingly, so we we um, done some reshoots for the Steve Jobs film, um, right. and they were reshot over here, and they wanted the the guy doing his piece on there and, he, and they wanted it to be getting it wrong um it got it right pretty much every time he wrote his name on it perfect and did it again perfect um he's going i thought these things were supposed to be rubbish <laughs> um well what they kind of they kind of were um but actually mm -hmm. they're really not as bad as i think people um give them the grief for uh, but i started to do a presentation know, of kind of where, where, where is my life gone with a picture of a, a, a newton and it's kind of uh, and uh, this is going back about three, four years when there was the first big uh, Galaxy Note. Mm -hmm. um, and the screen sizes are identical. No, Bezel, really, bezels, really. bezels have got smaller, resolution has gone up. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of go, well, you know, these days it was a black and white screen with a colour logo. And now it's a colour screen and everything's got black and white logos. <laughs> and it was like... <laughs> Almost tw tw 20 years later, <laughs> pen, touch screen, yeah. the whole thing, it's, it's, you know, ahead of its time. Uh, it really was. It really was. And that's, that's the internals. So uh, there's your ARM 610. An ARM 610, absolutely. Yeah. Custom ASIC memory, lots of I.O. Always, as always, too many analogue components to actually make up a board. <laughs> yeah. So without that, do you think ARM would be here today? No, because without this, the drive of this product, the spin-out would never have happened. Uh, Acorn, you know, Acorn faded away. It wouldn't have had the context to... It would have, um, the technology would have just gone into a cupboard and we'll mm. all have gone our own ways and it would never have been picked up. It would never have gone anywhere. No. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, we talked about... Um, a couple of times now, um, you know, been, uh, obviously a very, very good engineer, a very good marketing person. I know, uh, I was a really a bad engineer. Uh, no, 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 no. Well, somehow you managed to create some fairly good chips, so I don't know who you stole the ideas off, but uh, whatever. <laughs> um, but um, so, but I, do, I do find it really interesting that um, we've got some video when you were presenting, um, well, I suppose the ARM 610, to, to Apple. Um, and uh, you talk about, you know, I'm going to put my hat on as a marketing person um, and then you can ignore that and I'll go on and I'll talk to you as, a, as an engineer. Just quickly tell you what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk twice, the first time with my marketing hat on so you can ignore what I say and that'll be a little introduction. Then Al will talk about the ARM6 and I'll 
come back on with a technical hat on and talk about the ARM 610 and our future directions. And at the end of that, we'll take questions. Which, for me, as a, as a technical person, I really like because I mean, that's how a lot of engineers feel. You know, you forget the marketing stuff. Just tell me the meat. Tell me the this truth. Does. You know, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, it kind of feels. I just got this feeling. Clearly, it's not. But you go home hating yourself at night, and oh, I can't believe I'm a marketing person. Um, but, but, but you know, this industry, that that particular one, as it was at the time for Apple, really needed that. So you had this organisation that could really talk the talk around its product. Um, do, do you think that was key to getting Apple interested in, in using that chip, moving from the AT&T chip onto an ARM chip, or do you think that they were already seeing the value in that chip um, and you just need to grow no, uh, so No, they came to see us. They wanted to talk with engineers. They wanted to know we understood what their problem was, right. what what they wanted to change and for them to believe that we knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. And it was the credibility that we understood what they wanted and we were going to be able to deliver it. And I think that's pulled through to a lot of other customers and still today mm -hmm. that it is, we understand what you want and we're going to deliver it. Yeah. Um, and, it is a, it, and it is about that personal engagement, even as we're now an enormous company dealing with enormous companies, at the end of the day, there's some very narrow channels of communication between a small groups of engineers who have to believe that the other side knows what they're doing and is mm. going to deliver to, to schedule. Yeah, well, if you're going to partner with something like that, you've got to be able to trust yeah. them. Do you think any of that carried over from Acorn? Because whenever I hear about Acorn, no. um, those... Really? Let me finish. Um, but but, but talk, people talk about Acorn being a very um, good company to work with in terms of they would be willing to enter into discussions you know, this is our product. Oh, you want something slightly different. Okay, we can probably do that for you. Whereas other people talk about Sinclair from uh, what they were doing at the time being very isolated. And this is our product and that's it. We're not interested in talking to anybody. But Acorn no, were quite I, encouraging of... I, I, I think Acorn had undoubtedly... Um, the technology mattered. Um, sometimes mattered too much. Mm -hmm. um, we probably got where we were in some rational sense we should never have been there mm -hmm. um, versus maybe Sinclair of it's about cost it's about value engineering which created in the short term much more commercial success yeah, yeah. actually yeah. Uh, um, and we were probably a little potentially too much truth and beauty um, and I think the reason I said no is I think the bit Acorn didn't achieve for me was real engagement with the customers okay. in that most people in Acorn hadn't spent much time with customers because the assumption was I'm doing it with we, the customers. They weren't allowed near customers. Well, <laughs> well they weren't allowed. It's like kind of we were, own, we were our own customers. Right. In reality, it was schools. Yeah. The needs of schools were very different from nerdy guys using the home computer. There was, a, there was a big overlap, and that drove some of the home computing revolution and, and spoke to those, but then when it was in terms of, but a lot of your commercial success depends on how curriculum gets deployed in schools, that, well, that was something different. And in some senses, when it transitioned from engineering into what you might have said was a marketing problem, well, that wasn't real. Right. Whereas, in ARM, I think, because we had no local customers, because we weren't our own customer anymore, we weren't building chips, yeah, other you, people yeah. built chips, mm -hmm. it was actually what do the customers really want and how do we engage with them and how do we do what they need to get done. Whereas in Acorn, it was possible to live in a little bit of a bubble of, well, I'm using the computer myself. Of yeah, course, I know it's what, the machine I want. Right, therefore, yeah. I know what it is. So it was designed, in some senses, for us and then there happened to be customers. Right. And if that customer was a technical customer, yeah, there was an engagement, you could have a dialogue with them. I suppose we're mostly you, referring to the BBC. Yeah, yeah. but if you looked at, were, were we engaging with teachers? Mm. Were we engaging with the suppliers of curriculum deployment? No. Probably so, didn't need to in the first place because the BBC had done a lot of that engagement. But later on, as you developed, 
with the we Archimedes were, and things. You we were, were still di you were disconnected from yeah, that, yeah. and therefore customers didn't play a central role right. in engineering. Whereas in the beginning of ARM, customers and engineering, customers were the central part of engineering. It drove engineering. Mm -hmm. Customers didn't drive Acorn engineering. Interesting. In, in a, so do you think, uh, I mean, so Robbie Sachs we come in and, and kind of set this up and, and said, we need you to step up now and you need to do some marketing um, and you need to do some sales, whatever. Um, is that is that thanks to him? Do you think if he hadn't? Come oh yeah, along? He, there was, yeah, yeah. There was no there was no doubt that Robin was the perfect fit for us because he was the out and out. It's it, yeah, voice of the customer. It's about the customer. Right. It's about the money. It's about the cash. It's about keeping the customer happy, um, and getting us out on the road talking to people. Right and engaging was absolutely took us out of this sort of slightly Cambridge insular thing to mm. the customers are all out there, we're going to go and deal with them and interact with them. Um, and it wasn't just, we like Apple, so we'll go and deal with them. Mm. It's we're going to Japan for the third time in the last six weeks because we've managed to get a meeting here with Sharp and we've got a meeting there with AKI and we've got another one in two weeks time you know and we're just going to get on the road and keep going keep going keep going even if it's one of these Japanese meetings you come out and you go but this is the thing you make what no happened I didn't did anyone know what happened in that I don't know <laughs> was that good was it bad I haven't got a, I haven't got a clue oh well we'll see them again in three weeks time so so out on the road just kind of keep doing it keep doing it so this is the numbers game this is making your own luck you know you just yeah. get out there yeah um, very proactive let everybody know what you're up to. Um, and, and find the right people to engage with and yeah, then be impressive and deliver and do what you say you're gonna do, but you just keep knocking on doors. And that was Robin, I mean, we'd have kind of, well, I've been to Japan and it didn't work. Right. Not, well, I've been 30 times and we might be getting somewhere now. That, that, so that, there was undoubtedly, it was that sales guy, off we go. So, so did Robin come from a background of, of, of just doing that kind of thing? or He did semiconductor sales. I think if I, I, I mean, I'm going to get his, tr his, his history wrong, but he, he'd stepped out of semiconductor sales. I think he was working for a garage door company, if yeah. I... I, I might be, I might, be, I, 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 I might be slandering him at this point. People, I, people can I seem up. to remember he was working for a Darius Door company, you know, okay. he, rather than se he, rather than the semiconductor sales stuff. At the point that we were, um, he, he then came back and to, to work for Arm. So yeah, he was a sales guy, mm. which is what, absolutely what we needed. Well, there's not much else to it, really. Is it? You, you, make, you make well, you don't make anything, um, and you've got to sell it. Yeah. So <laughs> what else is there? Um, so from then on, so you were VP for marketing. You went on to EVP for business development. Is that right? Yeah, running scams, <laughs> making other things happen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, there was there's a, probably there was a better way to present that, Mike. Or do you want to no, retry no, that? No, 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 I'm happy with that. I, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a long track record of I'd run around and talk to people and start things and then Tudor would pick up the pieces and finish it off and deliver it. Okay. But um, and so, yeah, Mike will go in, talk to customers, promise things that can probably happen, plausibly happen, and Tudor would make them happen. Yeah, so this, would, this is marketing person is coming out again. And then I ran, mar then I ran marketing again, because our VP of marketing left, so I went back and ran marketing again. Right. Um, and fortunately, I then managed to um, recruit a real marketing person, which was Mike Ingalls, who ran marketing, then went on to run the processor group for a long time. Right. Okay, so then um, 2000, um, you become CTO. Yes, which um, was a more natural fit for me. So which this is Chief Technology Officer. Yes. Um, what, what does that, in, in, in terms of ARM, where are you? you, you you're, you're pretty much up there um, and you're looking after. Well, my goal technology. in ARM has always been sort of responsible for nothing, have nobody report to me and then be able to just go and stick my nose in and influence things. I mean, that's the ideal place to be. Other people want to have empires and reporting structures and control 2,000 people because then you can deliver things. But for me, I mean, yeah, yeah, people, oh, 
<laughs> you don't want people. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need don't need that influence. I need to learn from you. <laughs> you, you just you just need to have influence, okay? You don't need to have organisational structures. There are times in Ireland when I have an awful lot of people reporting to me, and then I tend to be able to package them up and give them away to other people, and then you acquire groups again. I you know the uh, the IOTBU which became ISG. You know at what point that reported to me, I managed to give it somewhere else and package it up. What do I do these days? It's a combination of talking with customers. I mean, you're um, out a lot. I'm, I'm on the road a so, lot. Um, um, but it's not just, it's on the road sounds very UK. I mean, you're around. No, no so on the plane. You're, you're, you're <laughs> <laughs> on the plane in the taxi, there's very little, yeah, there's not how much road there is involved. And so, um, so doing what? I mean, a large Don't part of it detail. is promoting ARM and being... To existing customers? or you Both existing limited? customers, new customers, working out new market segments. Um, I, 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 and I was big enough, there's a certain amount of just dealing with ARM. I mean, there's an awful lot of 6,000 odd people in lots of locations. That takes investment because you have to invest in the people. You have to take time doing that. You can't just you know, assume Let there's a machine that lets it happen and deliver. So, yeah. so, 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 so that takes time internal to ARM, travelling around the world, because ARM is a, is, is a distributed global yes, no company. Longer just the you know, right now, we're setting up a joint venture in China, so lots of chips to China, negotiating with our joint venture partners, meeting government, doing whatever, putting that together. Um, so it's a very diverse mix of things. And then back inside of ARM, my, my light relief is there's a research group, they report to me, so um, that keeps me in touch with what the future might look like. Mm -hmm. And then going out on the road meeting customers keeps you in touch with reality well, yeah. and, and shipping products. Because, I mean, that's, it, it must be mind-boggling. You've only got to think of everyday life now and the way that the, the ARM processor is so sewn into our lives, whether people know it or not, most don't. Um, but the number of opportunities now must be mind-boggling. I mean, because we're talking about medicine, we're talking about you know, reduced communication in general, which that's kind of done now, IoT. There's so many areas now. The chip is now so powerful and so small and so cheap that it can go in everything. Yeah, and it's the transition from, you know, early days of Acorn, um, you know, we're going to sell Herman's Light, you know, we're going to sell millions millions shocking you know <laughs> joke how were we ever going to sell a million arm processors it was clearly clear, clear, clearly farcical you know um with with, with, with robin it was we're going to be the global standard yeah right okay 12 people in the barn we're going to be a global standard yeah how sensible is that <laughs> uh, um and now we're on the road to 150 billion chips um and as you say, yeah, it touches everything. From oh. and, and what's weird for me is we, we've, we've closed the loop now with some of the server chips, you know, the hundreds of watts ARM power chip. Who knew we were ever going to build a 100 watt ARM chip? Um, and, you know, the 10 cent microcontroller. So, you know, 10 cents to 100 watts, we've got, we've got that scale. But for me, what's driving things now is, yeah, okay, we've got all this volume, we're designed into everything, things you don't know about. I can see you've got a plastic transit arm, 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 arm down there, but it's also how do you take arm to the next stage? How do you build softwares and services that go around that? How do you develop a whole new marketplace of things that you can do, value add you can bring that is beyond just the chip stuff? Because we're, kind of, we're doing that, we're doing that very well. And it's a bigger and bigger and bigger and growing market as you can afford to put electronics into just about anything. Mm. But then there's so much more you can do beyond that. It has to be the most interesting job because it, it, because of all those areas of life that it's actually Yeah, and, and what keeps it interesting for me has always been, even when we were quite small, you are, you know, 93, we're dealing with the world's third biggest semiconductor company. Then you're dealing with Apple, and then the next day you're on a plane, you're dealing with Samsung and Bosch and Nokia. Even, even when we were small, you know, hundreds of people, we were there changing products from the tier one OEMs that were affecting hundreds of millions of people's lives. Um, and so there's been this little bit where we've been able to sit there 
and have, in some senses, disproportionate influence. Mm. And you're dealing with you're dealing with the world's biggest, brightest, fastest moving companies, and that's been that's exciting. And yeah. then what's what's equally exciting is what the world like looked like two years ago, two years ago, two years. It's different. It just keeps changing. It's not as though. Yeah, I've been doing arm, you know, this is how it works. Uh, you said we have traditions, there's some stuff we like and we kind of have our routine, but the world we have t now is very different from what it was two mm. years ago and the challenges before that were very different, the challenges before that were very different. It keeps changing and that change is good. And you, you must have people just sitting there thinking about what comes next, Yeah, complete blue sky stuff. Um, a very small number of people in the research group do that. We tend to be fairly pragmatic in terms of you do stuff that you think you can see how you turn into a product and you ship out the door, and we're still quite conservative in that sense. Right. Rather than, ooh, I have hundreds of people in Ivory Tower who are dreaming up blue sky stuff, because most of that blue sky stuff just never makes it through into product, you know. No, but... You have to do a little bit. Yeah, yeah. we do. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so, so now um, is uh, been bought out by SoftBank. Um, can you tell us a little bit? About, I mean, because when when this was announced, I mean, I, I, I probably feel I should feel guilty for it, but I had no idea who SoftBank were. It meant nothing to me. Um, so, I, first, my, my initial thoughts were, well, who is this company that could buy our arm? You know, what, what's going on here? Um, yeah, it's funny because, I mean, for, for, for a long time before that, people would say, well, who, who's going to buy ARM? And our, our genuine answer was no one, right? Because we'd got, to, be. we'd got to a size, with FTSE 50, FTSE 30, whatever, come, you know, we were expensive to buy. Mm -hmm. Most of the people we ever thought would buy us, you kind of go, yeah, but they're only biased because it hurts their competition, it becomes a negative thing. Oh, Samsung buys it and then they can control all the mobile phone. Right. But, but it's a very expensive acquisition to kind of then go, oh, I'd now like to wrap it up and put it in a box. So you, our customers buying us would break our business model and therefore would break some of the value. Yeah. And, and so we kept saying, well, you can stretch, can't see who would do it, why would anyone do it? We're not gonna be bought. And then you wake up and it's kind of, okay, we're being bought. <laughs> and fastest ever acquisition on the FTSE 100. You know, Massa does like to just get things done. I mean, it was an incredible transaction because he went, there's no closing conditions. Yeah, but you need to get regulatory approval here, there, and there. No, we're just going to buy it. If it goes wrong, I'll, 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 I'll deal with it if, if, if the regulators say I have to break it out. That's my problem. I just want to buy it. Just get it done. No closing conditions. Just do it. Why can't we do it in two weeks? Well, it'll take a little bit longer than that. It's like two months, but it was really fast transaction, which is him all over. Uh, and, and you kind of go, uh, okay, why has SoftBank done that? Yeah. And, and, and you looked at it and you went, well, okay, I get it because he is fairly independent and the whole vision fund that he's created is, is, is becoming a, 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 an innovation investment portfolio. Um, dealing with lots of different partners. It's not just building a particular vertical. Um, and so he's quite... We'd never have identified that as a purchaser because we'd done the work as a, you know, as a... As a publicly listed company, you have to kind of do what's our defence strategy, who might buy us, what scenarios, talk to the bankers, come up with a list of possible acquirers. Never... You know, wasn't on the list, no. but with hindsight, you go, okay, that, that works, and it works partly because of who he is as much as what the company was, because what SoftBank is, it has been changing as well. Again, it's a company that's been in transition, and it's always been in transition, as to, you know, go back a few years, and people would have said, well, it's a mobile operator, and that's all it was, was a mobile operator, and before that, it was a software distributor. I mean, he was, uh, he, he distributed, um, it was a bank of software. He was a software distributor. Come yeah. to my bank and get software. That's what SoftBank was. Um, and turned it into a mobile business. Um, so that, for him, was the transition from it was PCs, and it was about buying software for PCs, SoftBank. Then it became about mobile, 
and now it's going beyond mobile and into the internet of things and software and services and all the things that go around that. Um, that's the next wave and that's what he's, part of the reason he's brought on is to participate in that next wave of the post-mobile revolution because kind of done that. Yeah. Still a profitable business both for SoftBank, Mobile, Sprint and for us but there's the next, the next wave to come and he believe, believes in buying into that technology early. Mm. So it's been quite a transition for us to go from being a public company to being owned by SoftBank. It's meant changes for what we do, but they're change they've all been changes for the good. Yeah. Is it, so it hasn't been much of an impact on day-to-day -day life. Uh, Arna still runs in the same way as it, it's done before? Or? Yeah, I, I mean... Do you have the autonomy to, yeah, to, to the, the, what the, you do the, 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 early, the early days of the acquisition, there was a certain amount of waiting for the Japanese to arrive. Mm -hmm. And they never came, right? <laughs> uh, uh, there the, 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 the was no machine arriving and men in suits to, to, to you know, it was, well, I bought the company because I like the company and I like the management team and can you keep running the company? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not, I've come here to tell you what to do. Yeah. I bought yeah. you because I like what like you're doing. What you're doing. Uh, um, so, 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 so th that, yeah, that, 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 that never happened. And um, on one level, the day-to-day -day stuff stays the same. On another level, um, it's funny. It's um, what's the Chinese saying? You know, be careful, whoever it is. Be, you know, be careful of what you wish for. Um, I sometimes look back and go, you know what? It used to be really simple. Priority one: close the quarter. Priority two: close the quarter. Priority three: close the quarter. <laughs> right. right? We were a public company, quarterly reporting in America, close the quarter, close the quarter. You know, when you have time, moan about how short-term short and short-sighted investors are. <laughs> if you have a little extra time, moan about how you can't actually invest enough in engineering to build the great products you want. Although revenues are growing, we've got to grow EPS more than that. And so, you know, we can probably squirrel away a few extra million uh, uh, to put into increasing the size of engineering beyond just the growth. Um, let's moan about the short term investors. Um, and with hindsight, you go, they were really, e so we were making really easy choices. I mean, not saying it, it was hard work, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Close the court, it's hard work, it's hard work, but hard work. But you look at it, it's fairly simple choices. You now say, well, okay, uh, we have an owner who's going to go, I want long-term growth. Um, I'm prepared to invest now to get long-term growth uh, in the future. So um, do the right thing. And all of a sudden you are. So I could, I could spend 600 million quid buying that company. I could spend 250 million quid uh, employing a whole load of my engineers. I could, we could actually probably spend 1.7 billion on that if we really wanted to. Do, do we? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know uh, what numbers you're talking about, Mike. Dollars. <laughs> you know, do no, I just meant scale. Yeah. So, so all of a sudden, the scales change from yeah. we can maybe do this 20 million pound transaction and it's all right, so we can do this billion dollar transaction. And the difference is we could always have done a billion dollar transaction. If we'd gone to the city and said, this is it, it's all laid out, yeah. and here's where my return is in three years time, thank you very much. Some would have gone, we hate this, we want to get out. Some would have bought it. We probably could have done a billion dollar transaction. Now, we can do a billion dollar transaction if we believe in six years time is the right answer. And it's a bit fuzzy in the middle as to quite how some of the numbers will work, but it's quite clear what the end play is. It's giving you because you, because you don't have to actually go, it's three years, and if you can't plot it out and deliver, 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 exactly, you're going to get crucified. Yeah. There's a bit of a wobble in it. We can do it. So all of a sudden, it's you can do what you want. You kind of go, ah, oh, that's quite difficult, isn't it? So, so in some senses, our lives have got harder because yeah. you've suddenly got choice. Choice is a difficult thing. I suppose, thing. I suppose. Yeah. So there's it sounds pretty good. So there's a lot of opportunity, <laughs> lot, a lot of choices to be made. And that, that's the transact. Day to day, still doing the same old stuff or whatever. But as you look through the kind of what investments you're making, how does it play out? A completely different world from where we were. And for the people who are kind of going, oh, it was a nice British company now it's been, yeah, we couldn't have done it. It's a small world. That. It's, it, couldn't, couldn't have done that. It's, you can't think, you know, the, the UK is not big enough to support 
And um, some people uh, do ask me, so well, how does it feel you're a UK company now, you know, by the Japanese? And I kind yeah. of thought, you know, I never really realised I was a UK company. I realised we had some UK culture, well, I realised we had some it's funny stuff, but we were a global business. We yeah. had no business in the UK. GC Plessy Semiconductors went out of business, I don't know, I can't really remember, 15 Long, years yeah. ago or something, right? Yeah. We had no UK business, so we, were employ we have people here. We still you're based in the UK. People here, so you're but, a global company. But it's not a, yeah, we're a global business and still see that as a global business. Yeah, so nothing changes on that yeah. score, and it's just going to get more and more like that. Yeah, around the world, full stop. Um, how does it feel? I mean, you, you, obviously, when you, when you look at those numbers now, the numbers you're just talking about, which is just crazy numbers, um, you know, at some point, you know, I'm a small acorn was was struggling, and you're you're not worried. You're, you're worried whether you should spend that thousand pound or that hundred pound or whatever. Oh, and now you're talking in the numbers you are. How clearly you're comfortable with it? But do you do you I think I've sit made down every now and then and go, hang on, I just realised what I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, no, I've no clue. I've no, never realised what I'm doing. No, I, th I, 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 and I think it's you kind of learn to put a naught or two or three on the end, and it's the same from going from a hundred people to a thousand people, and now it's going well rather than ten million, it's a billion, hundred billion or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you, you add a few noughts, you rescale yourself, and then you're back to. It's about the money, stupid. It's about the people. It's about the business model. It's about the technology. You know, the problems end up being very similar. Mm. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, the scale, yeah, and, and I'm not trying to belittle the fact there are real scale issues and scale does change things. Yeah. And it's one thing I think we, one of the reasons, again, we kept making our own luck is we managed through the growth of ARM to recognise we're no longer 10 people, we're 100 people. We're no longer 100 people, we're 500 people. And process, procedure, quality controls, project management, SAP for managing finance, you know, right, stuff that you kind of work out. We've, we've hit a scale point, which means, yeah, you used to do it with spreadsheets. That's just not going to work anymore. Mm, and, mm. and recognizing that you, there are real scale events where you have to change, otherwise you're going to trip over. Um, we've come through those, so scale really matters. But also, at the end of the day, it's about the customers, it's about the product, it's about the people. It's about the people, uh, and that stays the same. And yeah, yeah, it's still about the people. Stupid. Uh, and so, yeah, things change, but some of it all stays the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the number of volunteers at the museum that, that, that weren't part of ARM, that now are. <laughs> We've had people that come and volunteer that, that have always been part of ARM. And, and there is always, without any um, sort of deviance in the description, it is such a great place to work. Um, what, what makes it such a great place to work? One thing I hear is it's very open. Everybody knows what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, in some sense, I'm the worst person to ask because, I, I, again, I'm the I'm the frog slowly being boiled. I don't particularly notice the cha notice the change, right. right? But I think we've been good in that we've had disproportionately little politics and disproportionately little knowledge is power, and keeping it. Yeah, I know this, and therefore I can do stuff. And I think one of the driving reasons for that is, or two reasons, is predominantly everything we, most of what we do ends up going to customers. So it's all out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And everything ends up, not public, but, but out there with customers. So you can't keep it like this mm -hmm. because it's going to customers. So if it's going to the customer, everyone else can see it as well. So, so ultimately, we're being driven by customers. The, the gut, it's not just the product. It, the whole guts of everything goes to customers. And we've got this, as you said at the beginning, highly trusting relationship of engineer to engineer, talking about products, delivery, schedule, features, or whatever, which means it's all pretty open. And if you're hiding away doing this little thing privately in arm hidden away, then there isn't a customer involved and there isn't... So what's it's, the point? What is it? What Why was doing? that interesting or valuable? Because apparently nobody cares about it. Oh, I've now delivered this. So, so a lot of what we do makes things open. It's also always been, you know, 
Early days of ARM, 100% engineering. Management was engineering. Um, it's got that fairly simplistic, brutal, honest, painfully straightforward at times, kind of like, well, that's shit, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I've had some of that. <laughs> uh, 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 um, and, and it's kind of like, it's just out, it, it's just all out there. So, it, and it can be a little bit brutal, but it's also, I think, very friendly because yeah. another thing that made ARM unusual, I think, in the early days, management team, bunch of engineers, basically stuck with the company that that management team was there for a long time long look 10 10 15 not quite yeah 15 years mm. a long time it provided a stability mm -hmm. and that management team was a team we all knew we had our strengths and weaknesses and we were painfully aware that we were by no means perfect individuals, but together we managed to cobble it together and flog it to the customer and get away with it. And as I say, you know, I'd start something, Tudor would finish it. He knew he was the finisher. I, you know, we knew, right, we had a... And he has their special powers. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 and it worked, yeah. right? But yeah. it worked because we worked together and no one person could do any of it. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of collegiate, it all just hangs together and works was quite an important part of it. And again, Robin's attitude, which was pretty, um, I think that's, I think he taught me the sort of disrespect for, 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 for management. It was, you know, he'd kind of go, well, yeah, but I've just introduced him to this junior engineer here because that guy actually is doing it. So I've just put in touch this senior person in this company with that junior engineer over there. Right. And he'd just join those two people together and it would get, and, and you know. But things happen from that. Yeah, because that, that customer got exactly what they needed from the person. Rather than, well, you talk to this person, you'll talk to somebody else you didn't know about, you talk to somebody else, right? So, so the fact that we'd always put people, you know, if it needs A, B and C to go fix customer problem, that's what you're going to do. Right. I don't care if you report here and she reports there and you're working on that. Everyone kind of knew, big customer, big problem, fix it now. Yeah. Um, and so that whole kind of mix it all together and just get it done was an early part of the, how ARM had to work as a startup. Mm -hmm. nothing, yeah, nothing, say, un, nothing unusual. That's a, like a that was very, very thing. startup mentality. But, but yeah. that turned out to be stable across some of those scale changes. What worked at 10 kept going at 100, we kept going at 1,000, became part of the culture rather than it was great when it was a startup but now we're a completely different company mm. a lot so a lot of the arm culture became persistent because it survived time and scale changes which means it is fairly open and we always used to tell everyone what was going on mm. and here are the numbers and yeah it, the culture has been just fairly open and honest um, I, I think the way that you're talking about it is, is yeah, very, it sounds very, very startup. And actually, as companies grow, quite often they think they need to bin those ways of doing things because they're growing now. So it shouldn't be done this way. And there are things you um, have to throw away. Certain, certain right. Things. But there's other bits you need to keep. But I and think we've that always. That sort of thing, yeah. that does sound like it, that, that would normally be the thing. You, you're going to have to speak to these people. You're going to have the you know, certain level of support, whatever, um, and they will go back and, sp and speak to these people. But that does sound And like, arm culture actually... was always an important thing, and we knew that we were strange and different, and people who come to arm, it would be, well, that's not how we do it at arm. And quite a lot of that is because if you come from a company that's in some sense is more part of a vertical chain with competitors, the way you behave is very different from yeah, but I need to keep this ecosystem happy. I need to be fair to everyone. You might be able to screw this person over, but actually that's not, that's a short-term transaction that won't work in the future. The way we behave, the way we deal with our customers and partners is different. And we knew that people coming in would come from other cultures, which worked great for those businesses, wasn't going to work for us. So keeping that, that culture in a mindful way, knowing that it mattered and actually mm. telling people that that's not how it works at ARM. 
And the balance is how you kind of go, oh, we don't do it like that here. And 20 years later, it might be, yeah, and that's just stupid now, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you, you, ha you have to change, yeah. but you don't toss out culture just because things change. Because you, you, need, you, you need to as, be yeah. thoughtful and mindful about keeping that. And we've always, I think we've always managed to do that. Mm. It, it was an eye-opener um, when like, we first met, I think, because um, I come to Arm to, to talk about the museum. Um, and I was speaking to somebody and they said, oh, Mike's just come out of his office. We'll go and speak to him about this. And I was, oh, who's Mike? Said, well, he's, he's a big boss. You know, he, we need, he's, he's, um, uh, okay, wasn't ready for this. Um, and we came up to your office and, and you did tell me things were shit. And that, that, <laughs> that, that's great. And, and I did feel that actually the meeting that we had was basically exactly as you described it. It was very open, honest, um, just putting thoughts out there, very simple. But I come away from that meeting feeling a lot more buoyant about these things because otherwise because I thought I either argued them reasonably that makes them stand up um, or, I, or you had a point and I'm going to rethink that part then um, and you come back with some valid stuff from it whatever that might be so I can see that working in lots of other ways when you discuss um, you know the, the future direction of products or whatever um, that that can work and again it's one of those things that actually got, gets quashed quite easily through politics within the business as it grows. The politics, the machine, whatever, yeah. But if yeah. that can be kept, there's a, there's a lot going for that, keeping things straight and simple. Um, so, I mean, uh, people have said, I don't know whether, you're not going to think this is true, but you, you're possibly one of the most important people in IT right now. What do you reckon to that? I thought it never crossed my mind. I do like winding some people up who are uh, like my friends who work in the NHS or whatever kind of. I think I've saved more lives with the mobile phone than than, 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 than you have <laughs> as a doctor or whatever. But uh, it, but it, but it's easy to be at the end of a big <laughs> supply chain and sort of make make those make those claims. Um, but fair claim though. Very but that's fair. we arm, not me. Yeah. We have. I, I think arm has changed the helped change the world and I think some of it's for the better so two ways about it. Um, but that's that it's I mean you know we have our core values at arm and number one we not I um, and that's yeah so we are the most important part of the IT industry <laughs> not I that's so magnificent of um, so well I mean uh, we've got over uh, uh, a lot of stuff there. Uh, it's been incredibly interesting. One last point. So looking forward now. Actually, I don't know how forward this is. Maybe it's now back. I don't know. Pragmatic IC. Can you tell me about this? Okay, so... Um, so this is something, uh, just so that everybody knows, um, we uh, celebrated 25 years of ARM um, a while ago. Um, and as a surprise donation uh, to the museum, you come up with that bit of old plastic. So it's plastic. Um, what it's, is it? Well, it doesn't actually work. Can you tell us? Oh, did um, not. I didn't close. wonder. I've been trying to use it. Yeah. Um, so it's um, it's a mic. It's a, it, it's effectively uh, the original arm. It's like the original arm one. I mean, it's it, 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 it's a. It's, it's Cortex-M0, which is the right. modern replacement for the original ARM1, mm -hmm. but when you look at the size, transistor count, it's about, about the same. Um, so the M0 chip, for people that don't know, that's the chip that is in the micro bit? Yes, yeah. Yep. Right. so okay. it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a full on computer, mm -hmm. printed on plastic, it's in this plastic, it's actually more like cling film, if I could take it out, well you can take it out and show them, it, it, it's really thin, mm -hmm. um, which, Today you can make a prototype, you couldn't actually put it into manufacture. This is like, you know, 50,000 transistors and you can probably realistically today make tens or hundreds of. Um, so as a prototype, the yield on this means that this isn't really going to work. Right. But it's close uh, and within a few years then this will be volume manufacture. It's on something that's a bit like cling film. You can wrap it around a glass bottle, you can coat it over the surface of your wall, you can start to put, you can eat it, um, you can start to put transistors into anything and everything, it's, you know, it's so thin you can hide it away under, under other layers. So this um, is a flexible microprocessor? This is a, yeah, it's slow, it's, as I say, it's back to sort of what the te ARM technology was 25 years ago, but yeah. you could build 
these things, you know, I was with, with say, that kind of slow yeah. in comparison with yeah. your latest chip. Yeah. So, is um. this a mobile phone? No. Does this ever replace a mobile phone? No, because that that's however many generations ahead. But for me, it's the sort of thing where you start to go um, transistors everywhere. I remember this paper. I've talked about it. Uh, the guy um, who talked about paintable electronics when you can make the chips so small, each one with communication, you effectively have them as dust in your paint, you just start painting it over surfaces, saw it, nail it together, uh -huh. uh, you've got computing all around you. Well, this is the technology that effectively lets you do that, and I think this is how you end up with electronics, intelligence in absolutely everything. As I say, it's, it's the beginning of that curve, you can put this you can put this into production now for mm -hmm. kind of RFID tags and for small, simple electronics applications, but run it forward a few years and it's a, it's a fully blown micro bit um, invisibly attached to just about anything. I think it sort of is the next wave of mm -hmm. how you enable the internet of things into every, and actually make it into, into everything. So yeah, I think that is, this is part of the future. Wow. Well, well, thank you for donating it to the museum. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, it has been incredibly interesting. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. You, you've, you've got this amazing sort of... At least to an outsider, you, you, just, you just see you sit in there and you've got this company that is involved in so much of what the future is going to be, almost certainly. Um, it must be incredibly exciting. Um, um, anyway, thank you for for coming and talking to us. Thank you very much. Yeah.